I imagine that if you're listening to this episode the week it comes out, you've heard of me because I called the Dave Ramsey Show. And as you may remember, I started my conversation with Dave by saying, I want to thank you for your foundations curriculum for high schoolers and homeschoolers because without that, I wouldn't be debt free today. This curriculum is largely responsible for basically inspiring me to get through college debt free. It inspired me to stay away from credit cards, which ended up almost biting me in the rear. And we'll talk about that. But I thought it would be really interesting to share with you what this curriculum was like in my eyes before I had any exposure to Dave Ramsey. Before I went through this class, I didn't know who Dave Ramsey was. I didn't know anything about his books. I didn't know anything about Financial Peace University. I didn't know anything about his background. This was my first introduction to Dave. It's really interesting remembering what the videos were like with this curriculum because they basically took financial peace videos from Dave doing a live event and walking through the lessons for Financial Peace University, and they threw in some sidebar flyouts, which gave you the answers to fill in the blanks. If I were to flip to a random page in the book where I had to actually fill items in, you can see that they're just little fill in the blanks along with... Eh, some mildly interesting formatting. I could probably imitate it in a Word document. But that's the bulk of the workbook is just fill in the blank. I also have to say, I think they've really leaned into the fact that he's an entertainer to keep the curriculum captivating because the workbook on its own yeah, leaves something to be desired. At least the version I had from 2008. I don't, I don't know what the new ones look like. So let's talk about how the curriculum was structured for me. Again, I was a homeschooled student. My mom wanted to get us a personal finance curriculum because she thought it would be good if we learned what to do with money. And in her searching for something that was acceptable for our family values, she was recommended the foundations curriculum. The curriculum is broken up into four units. Each one of these units has three chapters. So there are a total of 12 chapters. And I think the way that I took it was one chapter a week. The first unit really focused on saving and investing. And here's something that's really curious. In the curriculum, Dave explains that his position is that you do not go and invest for retirement, invest for your future until after you've worked through school to be debt free if you indeed want to seek higher education. He says prioritize that over investing. So why does he start off with saving and investing if it's something that he kind of wants you to to focus on more later? Well, the saving you should be focusing on in almost any and all seasons of life. But it's also inspiring to think about how much money you can have if you save. And I think his goal with this first unit was to just inspire students with something that's exciting. You teach them about investing, and all of a sudden you're able to show them saving X number of dollars a week in a realistic number can have six zeros after it, after 40, 50, 60 years. I know that sounds like a little bit of an exaggeration, but there's a graph in the curriculum that I remember where Dave shows that if you have $1,000 and you invest it for 40 years in something that makes 6% on average, it equals, I think it was what, $9,000 in the end? It was actually probably just over 10,000. But the next column is Dave's magical 12% where it's something over $90,000. And for those of you who haven't seen it, the next column is an 18% average growth rate. And basically saying that $1,000 can turn into $750,000 in 40 years. That's, That's largely ridiculous. But again, he's trying to use these illustrations to inspire people to be optimistic and excited for personal finance. And I, I can't fault the will to inspire. I just don't think that presenting a student with an 18% illustration for investment growth is going to inspire realistic excitement. And I want to point out one more thing in this unit to pick on. There were some statistics that when I was going to school, when I was dreaming of my investment future, had me all sorts of excited and very confident in the idea of investing. And that was that in the stock market, over five years, again, this isn't this isn't real statistics. This is just what the book says. In the history of the stock market, 97% of five-year periods made money. And then it says that 100% of 10-year periods make money. 
that's not entirely true. And I there's there's no citation in the book to back up where this comes from. There's no graph. And I I've looked into the data. It's really funny because right after this book came out in 2008, we had the housing crash. And we had a long period of time that for many of you who remember it, felt like it was going to last forever, where genuinely a 10-year rate of return in the stock market was negative. 100% is just false. Now, if he looked at periods before that and saw things, sure, maybe, but the Great Depression was a thing. I'm pretty sure there were 10-year periods leading into the Great Depression or early on into the Great Depression that didn't make money. Okay, unit two is all about debt and the dangers of debt. I, on the whole, think this is the chapter that stuck with me the most because I became so allergic to debt. I associated debt with risk. And one thing I've learned since this curriculum by reading the book, Your Money or Your Life, is that debt represents a promise that you're going to work in the future in order to pay off something that you acquired in the past. In the more of your future time that you promise away today, the less freedom that you're going to have. And even though I prefer this mindset in my adult life, I like the way that Dave went through a series of myths and broke them apart. Now, myths from the Dave Ramsey perspective, that's the way he structured his debt class. And the curriculum spends potentially too much time focusing on debt collection and what it's like to be getting out of debt. This kind of thing is what I would expect from a 101 personal finance class. I would just expect a little less time spent on it because the the goal that Dave seemed to have here was to scare people from going into debt, number one. And number two, for those students who are going to end up in debt in the future, give them a tool that they can go back and reference and remember as to how to deal with their current situation and get out. Okay, about halfway through the curriculum, Unit 3, Dave finally gets into budgeting. And back in 2008, Dave primarily leaned on paper-ish forms to illustrate what it is to have a monthly budget. This is before he had an app, and spreadsheets were not terribly encouraged. And after going through this chapter in the curriculum, I felt like budgeting was an essential part of my personal financial life, and I was inspired to start but I felt like I didn't have all the tools I needed to be a successful budgeter. Hang on to the main topic if you want to hear about why. The rest of the unit focused on bargain shopping, which is interesting, and relationships with money. Like, if you were to grow up and get married, how do you prepare yourself financially for that, and how do you financially communicate about money? This part of the curriculum made me aware of Dave's top four things that you should agree on while you're dating before you get married. And it's something that I took to heart. Probably the most valuable thing I took away from this whole curriculum outside of money was this dating advice. But I took it way too seriously to the point that early on when Amanda and I were dating, I brought up these four points. And these four things are money, religion, existing family, saying basically you have to be able to get along with your in-laws, And last, future family. How many kids do you want to have? Do you want to have kids? What does your family situation look like after you get married? If you can agree on those four things, in Dave's words, your relationship is very likely to be successful. If you've been a longtime listener to the podcast, you've heard me bring these things up before in an interview with Michael and Vicky. And while my execution left something to be desired, can't argue with results. Things are going pretty well for me and Amanda right now. Okay, to wrap up the curriculum, Dave talks about career stuff, which is really important to talk to high school students about, like, how do you prepare a resume? What kind of career path do you want to have? How do you pursue that career? And somehow mixed in with the career stuff was a lesson on taxes, which I think could have been expanded on a little bit. And in the last two chapters, Dave covers insurance and then real estate slash mortgages in his perspective on those topics. And while they seem boring, It was very valuable for me as a teen to have an idea of what insurance policies I needed to have in my back pocket. You don't know what you don't know. As a teen and a young adult, I don't know what I would have done 
had I not been given an initial roadmap of policies that are needs for most people and policies that are not needs for most people. And as for the mortgage lesson, Dave's advice on mortgages really hasn't changed even from before the 2008 housing crash. He still talked about 15-year fixed rate mortgages, and he, in the curriculum, talked about putting 20% down. And I think on the other side of the 2008 housing crash, Dave has updated his advice, an example of where he's changed his mind, from being, you got to at least have 20% to, yeah, at least have 10%. We'd like 20, but we know that 20% isn't realistic for a lot of families these days. So try to at least get to 10. Okay, what were some questions that I had after going through this curriculum that were not answered? In addition to the budgeting stuff that we'll talk about in the main topic, there was some stuff about investing that I was confused with. He talked about mutual funds, and I didn't know where to go to get them. For someone who has a referral program as part of the main business model, He didn't talk about going and finding an endorsed local provider. As a young teen, I sort of became under the impression that there was a store, like a mutual fund store, where you could walk down the aisles and pick a box that represents purchasing an investment. It's like, hmm, this is a good one. A mutual fund store. And because how to go about actually pursuing investing was a little vague for me, it actually probably delayed me getting into investing more than anything else. So some clarity on that would have been awesome. For me as a teen. I also think the perspective on credit scores and the idea that you can always get a mortgage without a credit score through manual underwriting left me flat on my face as I was getting out of school. You see, by the time I had graduated college, I didn't accumulate any loans of any sort. I didn't have car loans, I didn't have student loans, and I did not have credit cards. I'd even called the Dave Ramsey show while I was in college and thanked him for the foundation's curriculum then too, saying, hey, I've been getting credit card offers in the mail. And because of you, I've burned them all. I've thrown them in the family fireplace. But when I graduated, I didn't want to rent. I wanted to buy just because of the real estate market I was going into. And I was enough of a problem solver to know, to look at the the cost of rent, the cost of ownership, and the risks therein given the amount of savings I had, I felt very comfortable moving forward with the idea of ownership. And I felt comfortable breaking Dave's rule about saving 20% down. I wanted to get right into this, even if it was a tiny down payment that I had. But guess what? If you are graduating college, you have no major work history. You lived with your parents, so you have no major rent history. You can't get qualified for manual underwriting. You don't have the history. You don't have the track record. However, if you had a credit score, you can totally jump into a mortgage right away, which is kind of ridiculous that, A, you clearly don't have the life experience to prove to me that I can give you a mortgage. But if you have a credit score that simply shows that you can use a credit card, then yeah, I'll give you a mortgage. But that's why I got into the credit card game for a short while. I built up a credit score, got a mortgage, got rid of the credit card game a couple years into having the mortgage, and have maintained a, a healthy credit score with the mortgage alone. That way, when we move, and you know we've moved since, I'll be able to still get another mortgage if I need one. And I so wish that in a foundation's curriculum that this sort of circumstance would be explained to teenagers who are the most likely facet of Dave's audience to run into this problem. But there's no room in Dave's worldview to discuss the nuance of not being able to get manual underwriting because you have no job or rent history. Dave's answer would probably be, well, you got to go out and rent for a little bit before buying. But buying was one of the best financial decisions that I have made in my life. Now, that might not be the circumstance for everyone who jumps out of school and buys right away. I understand that I am subject to some survivorship bias. But this should be something that's explained with trade-offs in the foundation's curriculum. Now, it's really curious that I had problems with the curriculum that helped me so much. I, I need to reiterate because I've caused it a lot of grief in this episode. It is a good curriculum, and it's definitely better than nothing. Personal finance is not taught enough in schools. And if you're homeschooling your kids, I think it's something that is essential for you to pass along to them. If you have nothing else, Dave Ramsey's curriculum isn't that bad. You just may need to work to fill in any gaps that you want to make sure your kid learns. So maybe go through it with them. 
Now, oddly enough, I've competed with the foundation's curriculum. When I was in Utah, the church that I went to had a, a homeschooling mom who wanted to get the Dave Ramsey curriculum for their kid, but they had heard some things about it and thought that, hey, Jay is a guy who knows personal finance stuff. How about I just hire him to teach my kid personal finance for homeschoolers or something like that? And this kind of extended to an idea for other homeschooling families in the community. How about we we just pay Jay for a curriculum and he teaches them? They show up in an evening like once or twice a week and go through a class on personal finance. So I took the good stuff that I learned from the foundation's curriculum and I took the lessons learned that I had on the other side of graduating college and I put together my own personal finance class for teenagers. And it was very, very successful. I'm working now on getting that curriculum translated to an online version that if you wanted, you could buy for your kids, but it, it might be a little bit of a ways off. It's something that I hope to be able to provide to you as a future value. Let me know in the comments below if you're excited for something like that. With that, it's time for today's main topic. 